Um, but as far as tonight's proceedings, um, again, reminder if anybody wants coffee, refreshments, everything is here and free and available. Um, after Dr. Morris has talked, we'll do maybe a five minute break um, and then we'll finish with Q&A. That should take us to about six o'clock. Um, other than that, I think those are all the administrative duties. Donovan, anything to say? Thank so you. this is Donovan Irvin. My name is Matthew Kroll. I should have started with that. Uh, we co-host the lecture series. Um, if you guys have any feedback, comments, questions, you can always email us. We also have um, a generalized account. I believe it's Phil Lit Soch, Phil Lit S O C at Purdue. So feedback, commentary, anything uh, is always more than welcome. Um, so for tonight's introduction, Professor of English Daniel Morris came to Purdue in 1994. He completed his graduate work at Brandeis University, earning his PhD in English and American Literature in 1992, and was a lecturer at Harvard before joining us here in West Lafayette. Dr. Morris' theories of specialization include 20th century American literature, poetry, and art, the relationship between American poetry and drama, popular culture, and Jewish American literature and visual arts. Dr. Morris has published articles for a range of journals, reviews, and reference works, including Talisman, PLL, Papers on Language and Literature, Journal of Popular Culture, and an entry on Williams Paterson for the Blackwell Companion to Modernism. His forthcoming article, Tech Support Says, Dead Don Walking, Tradition, the Internet, and the Individual Talent in the Poetry of Daniel Y. Harris, will appear in the January 2014 edition of the Notre Dame Review. Among Dr. Morris' many publications, his books include The Writings of William Carlos Williams, Publicity for the Self, University of Missouri, 95, and Lyric Encounters, Essays on American Poetry from Lazarus and Frost to Ortiz Kofer and Alexi, Continuum Press, 2013. Um, he also edited a collection of essays, Poetry's Poet, Essays on the Poetry, Pedagogy, and Poetics of Alan Grossman through the National Poetry Foundation, 2004. Additionally, Dr. Morris has published original poetry, including his books, Bryce Passage, 04, and If Not for the Courage, 010, both published by the Marsh Hawk Press. Please join me in welcoming tonight's illumination speaker, presenting Pedagogical Persona on Two Approaches to Literature and Criticism, Dr. Daniel Morris. Thanks. So just, uh, Matt's going to help you with this. Uh, <clears throat> this talk is just a kind of reflection on uh, two, teacher, two of my teachers uh, when I was at Brandeis uh, in the 80s and 90s. And uh, one is Alan Grossman and the other Eugene Goodhart. And uh, I found on YouTube just about uh, a little talk that uh, Professor Goodhart uh, uh, gave uh, that Matt's going to play, I think, about two minutes or something like that. And then I have a tape of... Uh, Professor Grossman uh, talking just a little bit about Yeats and more just uh, I want you to get a feel for their their, their voice and their style uh, than anything about getting the argument. So let's, let's listen to them for just uh, about 90 seconds each to get a feel for this contrast. And that's Mr. Goodhart there. On the phone. I can say something about how I came to write the piece. At some point months ago, liberal friends of mine had bombarded me with emails and phone calls. You him for failing to keep this is about Obama, by the way. And his in promoting a liberal, liberal agenda. He was disappointing the expectation aroused that he would be a transformative president. Compromise seems to be the mode, mode in which he operates most comfortably. His economic team has ties to Wall Street. His stimulus package was inadequate. He had decided not to prosecute the Bush legal team for sanctioning, torture, suspended terrorists, and so on. And I was struck by a disposition to give him little, if any, credit for his achievements on the economy, the environment, education, and support for the sciences, which were already considerable. Now, it's been a habit of critics in the media to invoke liberal heroes of the past, Lincoln, FDR, and LBJ as models for what an old presidency could achieve in times of crisis and find Obama terribly wanting in comparison. So I decided to read up on his predecessors for historical perspective. And the more I read, the more I was struck by the unfairness of the contrast. Lincoln, of the popular imagination, was a heroic figure who freed the slaves and preserved the union. That's great, yeah. So you can see he's talking about Obama and, and kind of, uh, he was 
some kind of first term. I don't think it was second term. And this is a, I'm kind of proud actually. I almost I found it, I think, through eBay or something. But, uh, you know, they have that so called uh, superstar teaching series. And, uh, of course, now they're all on DVD and everything. This one was a, a, just the old fashioned tapes. And uh, it was one of the first ones, I think, that they had done. And, and it's this Mr. Grossman uh, was the one. Called Poetry a Basic Course. I'm really proud I have this. So I was just listening to this in the car today. I was going to Target and I had some errands. And I just thought, okay, I'll just play just a little snippet. And, and he's talking here about Yeats and uh, among school children. It's just a little minute or two from the, the end of that, just to get a feel for the voice. And remember, I just hey, this is supposed to be kind of for a general education tape. You know, you're listening in your car on the highway, don't know anything about poetry, but boy, he really puts the pedal to the metal rhetorically, uh, I think, even with this. Quite a different style. You know. I love them both, so this is different. But here, let's see if we can get one of this. I just have this on here. Yeah. The archetypes of images, because in Yeats, they cannot die. But as the heartbreaking loss of access to them, the agony of the modernism that Yeats displays is the problematization or blocking of the access to the archetype. There is in Yeats an afflictive consciousness that the archetype lives. There is, however, a tragic sentiment that the archetype can no longer be put in service of humanity, that the archetypal school will never return its vitality to any actual teaching transaction. The synchronicity of the poem, the sense in which all stanzas are at once, and each stanza is a box filled and refilled, is defeated by the relentless diachronicity through timeless counting of narrative, this irreversibly, after that, never return. Okay, At the moment of line 50. Yeah, good. That worked out nicely. Okay, thanks. Man. Yeah. Thanks so much for these guys putting on this incredible uh, series. Great honor to be here. It's just to see so many friends. It's an awesome, awesome feeling. So uh, <clears throat> you can see, this is going to be kind of a reflection of uh, I put on my old man glasses, you know, the one thing. I think somebody told me there was a great episode of Sanford and Son where uh, you know Red Fox and he would sit by the chair and he had like 50, 60, you know, whatever these pairs, he'd always be like re rifling through to find the right one, you know. So I'm, I'm kind of getting to that. So yeah, so uh, it's good. I can't. You're all blurry, but this is nice and clear. So uh, you'll see, this is kind of a, a personal reflection, but hopefully it has some meat to it that the. The nature of the series, the line of that series, with the element of some thoughtfulness, but uh, but there's a personal touch as well. I think it's uh, <clears throat> self-doubting, but also like uh, proof rock, self-obsessed. I assumed as a broke twenty-something slouching towards a PhD in the quintessentially unmarketable field of modern poetry analysis, everyone I'd ever met waited in line for headlines about Danny World. Who is he studying with? I imagine their envy. I worked with Grossman, Grossman, the Brandeis English Department's quite literal resident genius. In August of 1989, Alan Grossman received the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Genius Prize to continue for a period of five years. In assessing why I was drawn to Grossman as teacher and mentor, it is, however, inaccurate only to regard my interest in him as if I were a weak-kneed quarterback of a bum arm and Grossman of blindside level offensive front lineman who would lead me into the end zone of professional success for me a tenure track position with less than a 4-4 teaching load in a town that had at least one Chinese restaurant. <laughs> By clearing the way as I stumbled, stumbled across the goal line, passing my defense. Certainly Grossman was magnetic. I was drawn to his cultural power, wanted reputations, awards, and charisma. But Grossman was a Brandeis legend since the 1960s for a reason. Brandeis graduates still write into the alumni magazine to recall Grossman's stirring words at a vigil on the night when Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis. He was a one-of-a-kind teacher, maybe the best poetry pedagogue alive. In 1987, he was named a Professor of the Year by the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, and his poetry, a basic course, was among the first recorded by the now popular Teaching Company, which produces what it calls the great courses in their superstar teaching series. Grossman's Summa Lyrica, primer of the commonplaces in speculative poetics, which I will discuss in detail in the second part of the talk, is considered by leading poets and scholars to be a literary sacred text, quote, in the ideal writing program where criticism and creative writing imply, sustain, and nourish one another, Alan Grossman's Summa Lyrica would be required reading, 
writes Alan Shapiro. The Poetry Foundation website describes the book as a cult classic. Roger Gilbert, chair of Cornell's English department, has written an essay comparing Grossman favorably to Harold Bloom, Gilbert's dissertation advisor at Yale. Beyond the hoopla, Grossman had an uncanny knack for making poetry in the lecture hall and in office hours for countless students over a 30-year career at Brandeis, and then as a Mellon professor at Johns Hopkins until his retirement a few years ago. Uh, he, had, he had the ability of making the genre seem like a lifeline to lost souls. Grossman, who grew up in Minneapolis before heading off to Harvard, liked to note that fellow Midwestern poet Hart Crane's father had invented the lifesaver candy. Ironically, Crane died in a drowning accident. As former Brandeis student Gary Roberts has written, quote, Grossman has conducted through poetry and criticism a radical research into the hypothesis, the groundwork, of transcendental knowledge and its representations. Such literary research seeks to disclose the implications of its claims for the keeping, an important term in Grossman's work, of Western personhood in the present discredited civilization, which has now attained the ability to erase all persons. That's this Roberts who's Robert suggests how Grossman transformed researching poetry into a suspenseful project worthy of Hitchcock. Quote, no age prior to this age was ever so fully endangered by precisely that eventuality which poetry always contemplates, namely forgetfulness or obliteration, Grossman asserts in The Sighted Singer from 1992. For the safety of the community and with the fate of personhood in peril, Director Gross Detective Grossman was searching against the clock he argued we live in what he called an age of nuclearism, and thus had, quote, attained the ability to erase all persons for the antidote to, quote, keep us from vanishing, another key Grossman term. We lived, he said, in a discredited civilization that I imagine as resembling the brooding existential terrain of a film noir set such as Night of the Hunter starring Robert Mitchum with the words love and hate tattooed on his knuckles. Poetry, Grossman preached, was no minor art hanging on like an appendage to a corporate body no longer in need of its services for proper functioning in a postmodern hypermedia society. Instead, it was, quote, a resource of last resort for people like me, and I suspect many other scruffy grad students living in hovels with desks made of abandoned doors propped up on book milk, book filled milk crates we lifted from behind the 7 Eleven, who felt isolated and misunderstood and thus desired acknowledgement from other blocked souls through lyric, which Grossman noted was at once the most private and the most universal of all genres. Quote, because I could not say it, I wrote it out in verse, wrote Emily Dickinson. My own dissertation subject, William Carlos Williams, had written in Of Asphodel, That Greeny Flower, quote, I come, my sweet, to sing to you. My heart rouses thinking to bring you news of something that concerns you and concerns many men. Look at what passes for the new. You will not find it there but in despised poems. It is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for, what is, for, for lack of what is found there. The late poet and critic Reginald Shepard writes, quote, Grossman shares the romantic and high modernist exalted idea of the poet's vocation and of the power of poetry to engage and encompass the world on equal terms. Though his poetry is not devoid of irony or even humor, Grossman is never embarrassed or ironic about the greatness he believes poetry to be capable of making apparent, nor about his own ambitions to approach such greatness, although in his view its attainment is impossible. To write the perfect poem would be to reach the end of poetry, says Roger Reginald Shepard. Maybe Grossman's theory of poetry as a lifesaver made of words was in retrospect a tad manipulative. Himself a social mitzvah, I could argue the reading of poetry as a preservation of personhood in a discredited society was his strategy to draw into his orbit other socially blocked people who were only too ready to discredit a society that had not made room for them. Reviewing How to Do Things with Tears, a poetry volume from 2001 that riffs on the speech act or performative language philosophy of J.L. Austin, critic James Loggenbuck notes in the Boston Review that, quote, Grossman makes a singular statement Poetry is what we do with memories, and remembering is what we do with tears. I was and remain a person who lives as much in the past as in the present. I was thus drawn to Grossman's emotional logic. Great poetry was not merely, as Matthew Arnold had argued, the best words in the best order, but rather a transformational feeling machine. It involved a chain of events in which an involuntary physical reaction to emotion, tears, precedes a semi-voluntary internal emotional mental process, remembering, which then, through effort, can be redeemed into meaningful artistic form. Grossman was telling me suffering could be transformed through work. I suffered and was willing to work. A kid who grew up with a single mom and lived on social security benefits and food stamps, 
I had worked all my life as a janitor, a busboy, a word processor, a secretary temp, flipping burgers at Burger King, bagging groceries, a stringer for a local newspaper, delivering newspapers and handbills. I knew how to type. I could read and write. I could do something with, make something out of, reject, anxiety and rejection. Literary language expressed the human wish, wish for acknowledgment. But the lyric concern, Grossman also argued in works such as The Sighted Singer, counterintuitively, was not on preserving the image of the authorial self, but rather on expressing the authorial self's desire to preserve the image of the beloved, the other, the you addressed by the speaker. This emphasis on the apostrophic figure of address, the you, was so, even as ironically we remember Shakespeare, Shakespeare and not the image of the dark lady, whom the bard considered comparing to a sum, summer's day and decided not to and even as he promised the beloved at the end of Sonnet 18, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in its shade, in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. <coughs> According to Grossman in The Sighted Singer, even such an apparently narcissistic lyric as When I Have Fears by John Keats was motivated less by Keats's anxieties about his own early death, he died at 25, and more by his concern that upon his death he will no longer be able to cast his eyes upon and put pen to paper to represent his beloved Fanny Braun, the quote, fair creature of an hour that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. Grossman argues, quote, and this is Grossman, the beloved in Keats's poem is the most complex and at the same time the most precious of the possessions of a speaker, namely the principle of the continuity of that speaker who in his terror contemplates his own disappearance. Keats, expre Keats expresses anxiety about the impossibility of writing out the nature of the world. Keats, Keats obtains for us all a sense of the enormous obligation which poetry sponsors to specify an object of love for it is the object of love, his fair creature of an hour, this is Grossman, which is the cause of his fear. The object of love calls attention to the stake of the speaker in the world, and the stake of the speaker in the world is recuperated by the act of writing, so that out of the anxiety, which the beloved, by her perishing beauty and by her dependence on the lover for her being arouses, there comes this record, which stands as a modeling of the courtesy to which love calls us, the courtesy of song, of magnanimous acknowledgment. Grossman thus invoked a straightforward but provocative idea. Poetry was not self-expression as the hackneyed creative writing teacher phrase of finding one's voice, but rather in the business of constructing an image of self in a valued form he termed personhood. Grossman in The Sighted Singer distinguishes selves and persons, and this is Grossman. I believe that poetry is fundamentally anti-psychological, and I would summon as my witnesses the high modern poets with their advocacy of impersonality, which led them all, each in his own way, to reject the analysis of the real self that we find in Freud. I am, in effect, saying to you that poetry has a destiny not in selves, but in persons, and that whereas selves are found or discovered, persons and personhood is an artifact, something that is made, an inscription upon the ontological snowfield of a world that is not in itself human. As Micah Towery reports, and this is, a, I thought, a decent gloss on what Grossman's point is about, about personhood, it says, Grossman sees persons as value-bearing, and he differentiates persons from selves along this line of value. The self is something that can be discovered or found. The self is what Freud parsed, a hurricane of secret desires, phobias, and complexes. Persons, however, are what poets write about. They are artifacts. Now, to say it is a construction of sorts does not mean it has no presence. I don't think of this construction as a mask, a falseness, something that obscures, but rather the actuality of what we perceive when we encounter other selves. In other words, I experience my catauri as a self, myself. You, however, encounter me as an object in the Thomistic sense, but more a person. You encounter my presence through my writing. Towery emphasizes two key points about Grossman's theory of poetry that speak to how he crafted his persona as teacher and mentor. The first is that poetry is not, as I had long assumed, narcissistic, but rather, as I noted above in remarks about Keats and Shakespeare, is driven by a desire to imagine the beloved, as well as to foster communication and response from another. The lyric task, Grossman argued, was not for knowledge of self so much as it was a way to project an image of identity that could be encountered by another character. The second point, which I will stress in remarks about his Summa Lyrica, is that poetry functions through what grows between my ordinary sense of self, flesh and blood Danny, 
and the representational image of Danny that, if performed appropriately, might bestow upon me the rights of appearance as a person. Because of the difference between self and personhood, lyric appearance entailed experiential loss. Here is Grossman, quote, when Yeats came to contemplate the relationship between the obligation of the poet to establish personhood and the inevitability for the poet of his being a self, he found that personhood and selfhood were indeed in irreconcilable conflict. Okay, now I'm just gonna shift over and talk a little bit about this Summa Lyrica, and you'll see that's a bit of a shift here. There's this little part, and then there's the part where I talk about good art. I've been rereading Grossman's Summa Lyrica, which I, here I speak without hyperbole, regarded as my sacred text. My copy of the special issue of Western Humanities Review, spring 1990, devoted entirely to Grossman's Summa Lyrica, a primer of the commonplaces in speculative poetics, a text of about 130 pages, and a long poem of about 13 pages uh, called The Ether Dome and Entertainment. Uh, that comprised the whole issue of the Western Humanities Review. Granted, now 23 years old, my particular issue, is so leafed through that individual pages, the leaves, have literally come apart from the binding. When the journal dropped off my nightstand, dozens of pages flew to the floor and, like leaves, falling after they change colors in autumn into a disorganized mess. By contrast to my disheveled Summa, Grossman's plan for the Summa could hardly have been more organized in its structure and form. Order is the key term. As Grossman asserts in his preface, quote, the basis of order in the Summa Lyrica is the procession of commonplaces, loci communis, assertions which are possible to be made and generally are made in the presence of poems. I notice the use of Latin terms, which in the case of the term for commonplaces, detaches authorial voice from commonplace. Grossman's Summa is divided into hyper-organized units, numbered units, each devoted to a topic, immortality, reading, silence, poetic language, self, privilege, and so on. Each numbered unit is subdivided into numbered subunits, 1.1, 1.2, and so on. And many units include scolios, special commentary of a scholarly sort by Grossman or from the numerous critics, philosophers, and theorists, he quotes. Grossman also includes a complicated number system to cross-reference information relevant to more than one topic. In typical Yawa fashion, Grossman described the Summa in the pre preface in terms of satisfying his aspiration for a holistic vision of the genre, quote, the attempt has been made to make this work total, a Summa, that is to say, to place individual analysis in the context of a version of the whole subject matter, end quote. As with Sir Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, Grossman's focus is on the whole Megillah, to switch from Catholicism to a Jewish reference to the Book of Esther that Grossman indeed liked to cite, as he might say, or in certain sections of the Summa, of how the part relates to the whole metonymy. A Yeats scholar, Grossman, like Yeats, wanted to connect what he called the incident to the archetype. His reading of Yeats' Easter 1916 was a site for his analysis. Easter would be the structural figure for the sacrifice of mere being, selfhood, for a significance, personhood, that requires a violent transformation into representation that the Irish revolutionaries, shot to death in a post office during the rebellion against British rule, underwent. The poet's role is to manage the form of the poem that will keep the names of the political martyrs in mind. And this is from the Yeats poem. I write it out in verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Purse, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Like Yeats in Easter 1916, Grossman in the Summa asserts that the poet's primary work is naming persons. Quote, a poem facilitates immortality by the conservation of names, he writes at 1.4. It is a humane project, but I wonder why in the preface as elsewhere does he avoid the first person voice and use the ongoing past tense has been made? Why not say, in this book I try to make this work total? Clearly, as in my student advisor relationship him and Brandeis, the message to the reader of the Summa was, once more, nothing personal. Words poured out of Grossman's mouth in oracular tones in lecture halls, but rarely, at least in my experience, in relaxed human-to-human -human forms, such as a friendly conversation over coffee. In fact, Grossman mysteriously once told me, poets cannot have friends. Another time at a rare departmental picnic to celebrate a nice spring afternoon following a poetry reading, Grossman managed to amble over to the party in his ubiquitous gray suit and tie, however hot the day. He stood a few hundred yards away from the rest of the group, smoking his pipe and looking off into the distance. I came up to him. Why are you standing so far away from everyone else? Why, not, why don't you join the party? I gave that up a long time ago. 
Although I was his student as well as his teaching assistant for a good four years, I never was asked over to his Lexington house or out to have a dinner with him at a Cambridge restaurant. I think we ate lunch together one time at the generic Brandeis cafeteria. An undergraduate student who had taken his general humanities class and to whom I was her section's teaching assistant had just committed suicide, and I needed to tell him about it. He ate his tuna fish sandwich. As he ate his tuna fish sandwich, I tried to explain to him which of the students just small faces in a lecture hall I was referring to. He paused from his eating and seemed to turn inward for a few moments. Yes, I remember her, a strange and mysterious young lady. In the Summa, Grossman's impersonal rhetoric was paradoxically, I'd say self-consciously, alerting the reader, allegedly in his theory of poetry as an act of love directed toward the safety of the beloved, that whatever that whatever care he or she may receive from his systematic account of poetry will not resemble human nurturance. This will not be a quote from Mike Myers, Barbara Adore in New Jersey I on Saturday Night Live, coffee talk. We know this will not be coffee talk from the bardic tone evident in the first of the numbered statements of immortality. Quote, one, the function of poetry is to obtain for everybody one kind of success at the limits of the autonomy of the will. Question to self. Did you ever truly or even somewhat sort of get what Grossman was saying in even this first of his commonplaces? Or how about this sentence from 4.4 on poetic language? The source of the poetic quality is the risk of commitment of all being to an unalterably singular manifestation. Or later on in 4.4, <coughs> at the point where manifestation really occurs on the outer skin, as it were, of representation, presence is post-catastrophic on poetry and the brokenness of words, see 31.15. Hence the ideology, this is still from that same passage, hence the ideology of the unique language event, style, is a repetition of the nature of manifestation elevated to a moral allegory. Poetry incorporates as a rule, as the differentia specifica of its kind, the sacral history, sacrificial history of presence. I again find myself wondering about the cropping up of Latinisms, in this case differentia specifica, in portions that I am already finding opaque because of the abstract approach, not to poems or even to a specific poet's body of work or even to a period or national version of the genre, but to poetry itself. What is the function of the Latin phrase? Clarification, amplification, nuance, a registration of the symbolic powers Grossman is bringing to his discourse to fortify an overall effective unquestionable authority. Here is a more generous reading of why Grossman has selected a remote discourse for his summa. In the Summa, he claims for poetry what he calls an iodetic function. And I looked up the word iodetic in, in Webster's online. It means marked by or involving extraordinarily accurate and vivid recall, especially of visual images, iodetic memory. So uh, according to Grossman, as in the comments I glossed earlier with references to Yeats's 1916, Easter 1916, the use value of poetry is to preserve the human image and the name of the person across time and space through attention to image placement in a lasting formal design. Grossman loved to quote the eighth quote, all that is perishable rots, salt and ice make for the best packing. The difference making artifice of form, line, measure, meter, imposed on ordinary prose discourse is for Grossman the impersonal difference that packs the image for preservation. Following this logic and then adding to it his Jewish understanding of holiness, and he has a great essay about holiness that he wrote as based in a conception of world-making characterized in Genesis and throughout Torah as a process of distinguishing realms and a separation of experiences, times, and spaces, kosher, trade, Sabbath, secular, weekday, God, human, sacred, profane, earth, water, human, animal, male, female, Grossman, somewhat counterintuitively, argues that for poetry to perform its iodetic function of preserving the human name and image across time, the culture of holiness based in separation of distance must be in place. But because we live in a post nietzschean realm, it seemed to Grossman, a belated modernist echoing the Arnoldian notion of art as a replacement for spiritual yearnings once framed in a religious setting, that impersonal literary structures must fill the breach left by the death of God. Formal verse must perform the not human, artificial, and thus difference-making functions on behalf of the visibility of the human community once associated with the God function, who in Genesis spoke the world into appearance through a process of differentiation land, water, day, night, human, animal, and so on. I suspect that Grossman's unwillingness to imagine himself as an ordinary human speaker, but rather to occupy the position of extreme other with all the answers who emits the whole system of poetic knowledge, 
is his way of imagining poetry as a surrogate discourse of holiness that is needed if poetry is going to allow persons to continue to see each other. In Scolium on God, 17.5, he says as much, quote, the first constitutive rule of image construction, iodetic substantiation, is the distinction of realms. The most fundamental distinction prevented, presented by Western culture is the distinction between man and God. God creates man at every moment of interhuman perception by participating as difference in relationship. The imitation of this difference, inherent in the grammar of metaphor, accounts for the sense we have of the centrality of metaphor in iodetic human presence discourse. Following from his comments about the bitter logic of poetry, it is as if Grossman, as teacher and mentor, felt he had to dissociate. I wanted to say sacrifice his human identity as an ordinary social being, a self, from his bewildering persona as Vatic teacher and bard to imagine poetry as a third term or impersonal measure of difference that could allow for others to see each other as human. I find myself more skeptical than I did 25 years ago about the grounds of what Grossman referred to as poetry's bitter logic. Is poetry's only role primarily commemorative to preserve names and photographic images of persons? Is such a role ne necessarily based on registrations of distinct realms of appearance? Is form really so crucial in helping readers imagine and remember names, as Grossman states? What does it say about Grossman's ambitions, one could say chutzpah, to take on this Atlas-like task of carrying the world in his arms so others can see each other? All of that said, I can see why I was far less interested in asking those kinds of questions than in feeling impressed that a field I was starting to study could have such a crucial world-preserving function, and how lucky I was to be studying at the feet, metrical and otherwise, of the man who was not a man but the spokesperson for personhood via the poem. Myself, a poorly prepared grad student, with a spotty undergraduate record and not a dime in my pocket, why wouldn't I be drawn to a voice and vision that promised us visibility? Eugene Goodhart was the other elder Jewish-American intellectual in the Brandeis English Department when I was there in the 80s and 90s. His writings focus on themes comparable to Grossman's writings. How religion and literature relate to each other, for example, concerns both men, as does literature's interpersonal dimension as well as the problem and promise of the development of an inner life in an alienating modern world. Both Jews born in the 1930s, both distinguished professors at the only secular Jewish sponsored university in the United States. I'm struck by their compassionate reading of Christian-centered texts. Goodhart's defense of the malign 19th century English critic Matthew Arnold, for example, focuses on Arnold's Pauline reading of resurrection as a symbolic state of internal transformation. In fact, part of Goodhart's project in books such as The Skeptic Disposition and Contemporary Criticism is to rescue Arnold from contemporary dismissals of him as a statist and elitist whose notions of touchstones and definitions of canonical literature as the best words in the best order as an embarrassing whiff of naive appreciation as well as disinterested objectivism. Writing in the wake of the heyday of deconstruction, which Goodhart reads primarily as a form of nihilism, Arnold becomes for Goodhart a champion of criticism, unafraid to associate literature with a kind of secular religious viewpoint that expresses yearning for transcendence. Quote, though Arnold was an acute witness of a process of secularization that would eventually sever literature from those religious ideals, he wrote at a time when secularization meant an eliciting rather than a demystifying of the values to be found both in secular literature and in the scriptures. For Arnold, literary culture reveals the hidden meaning of Christianity. Uh, Goodhart continues, I'll give one more quote here. Arnold insists on St. Paul's literary use of terms like grace, new birth, and justification, which in Arnold's view have been blunderingly taken in a fixed and rigid manner, as if they are symbols with as definite and fully grasped a meaning as the name's line or angle. Paul's language must be read as metaphors for inner states of feeling. Reciprocally, it requires a kind of religious sensitivity to perceive the spiritual character of poetry. What, Arnold, what Goodhart says of Arnold, I suspect, could be read as a piece of displaced autobiographical reflection on Goodhart's part. Quote, though he lacked a mystical sensibility and probably mistrusted all accounts of the supernatural as evidence of a dogmatizing intellect, he had a profound feeling for the transcendental character of the religious idea of what he called the power not ourselves, which makes for righteousness. Goodhart advocates for the aesthetic and spiritual dimensions of literature. Again, like Arnold, he is also a social critic. Quote, society is the arena in which the best self is realized, writes Goodhart in reference to Arnold. Grossman's voice, I have argued, was not one designed to sound as if it stemmed from a mortal being, but rather was meant to be like Whitman, the representative invocation of perfected personhood. By contrast, Goodhart's self-stated and decidedly Aristotelian virtue is balance, 
which he describes as, quote, taking seriously what is of value in opposing positions. One of Grossman's, Goodhart's, sorry, one of Goodhart's tactics in dealing with the narrow viewpoints of both left and right wing approaches to the culture wars was to deconstruct the false binary between tradition and innovation, in part by relying on Freud's notion of the uncanny. In the uncanny canon, he enters the fray in the culture wars controversy about the canon, the battleground between conservatives such as William Bennett and Roger Kimball, who regarded the canon as a timeless repository of values such as courage and justice and the, ra and the radicals, liberals, feminists, postmodernists, and especially multiculturalists who claimed the canon was rep repressive and imperialistic because it promoted the perspectives of dead white males from aristocratic cultures. Good art has, to employ his Freudian term, an uncanny ability to capture paradoxes, ambivalences, contradictions in, and his own mixed feelings about, critical perspectives and philosophical heritages that seem diametrically opposed. And at the same time, Goodhart, who has been accused of pulling punches and revealing a liberal wishy-washiness that avoids action and definitive statement because he sees merit in many sides of the question, is in fact steadfast in his, again, Freudian resistance to ideologically driven readings. Among Goodhart's reading principles are that the classics by no means promote a unified perspective on human experience that can be inculcated by conservatives to define a common set of standards about ethics, aesthetics, civics, or theologics. Goodhart points out that the Western tradition is in fact marked by conflicts as wide as those evident in the differences between Marx and Adam Smith, Plato and Nietzsche, Kierkegaard and Hegel. Further, he notes that it is far from clear how contemporary readers are supposed to respond to Achilles' wrath and the misanthrope of, of misanthrope qualities of Nietzsche and Swift. Are we to imitate, resist, notice such qualities in us and try to reform them? Like Gerald Graff, who urges teachers to teach the conflicts, Goodhart steers clear of right and left-wing resistances to canonical literature because, he argues, the canon itself in Whitmanian fashion contains multitudes of approaches to life. The Western canon, far more an unruly text than a distinct and unchanging set of works, Goodhart argues, accommodates quarrels between the rationist Plato and the immoralist Nietzsche, between Enlightenment liberalism and Burkean conservatism, between the Augustan affirmation of reason and the romantic celebration of the imagination. The energies of art are often subversive and not easily contained within a canon, which is a term of theological orthodoxy. There is a difference between indecision and occupying the space between orthodoxies while resisting the temptation to avoid complexity in the name of ideology, political correctness, traditional standards, or groupthink. There is nothing wimpy or punch-pulling, for example, in his critique of leftist canon bashers. Quote, the unmasking critic tends to regard the canon and the classics that constitute it with a generalized mistrust, as if the canon was an imperial conspiracy to dominate uh, the mind and not open it. His ability to locate distinctions as between opening a mind and dominating are among his effective methods of moderating extreme positions. Able to think against himself to understand and possibly find merit in a position not his own, Goodhart goes on in the essay to wonder about the motivation for resistance to classics. He notes the populist bent in American culture that associates difficulty with elitism. He then comments on the paradox that much left-oriented theoretical canon critique is itself elitist in that it challenges the canon via an opaque discourse, and also because of the patronizing tone in which those who critique the canon do so, in part, because they believe, quote, groups need to be, to be protected because of their perceived incapacity to respond to what is not immediately available. Goodhart is demonstrating what it means to think critically without prejudice, and what it looks like to make discriminations in arguments about important social and literary issues, in this case about the canon. Goodhart further challenges conservative and progressive views on the canon by pressing against one's own resistances and challenging assumptions held by other critics, such as the association between difficulty and elitism. In deeply Freudian fashion, Goodhart offers his view that classics matter not because they uphold past truths or confirm ways of being we already take for granted today and merely need to see fortified and distinguished representations as valued in the past, but rather that in the language of Christova, the classics may draw upon the stranger within ourselves and so expand and challenge our pat notions of identity. Heart of Darkness is such a text that challenges received wisdom and even our notion of what it means to be ourselves. And here's uh, Goodhart on that text. Like Marlowe in Heart of Darkness, who, who to his astonishment finds himself responding to the menacing howls that he hears in the African wilderness, the howls of repressed voices in himself. 
the most rewarding reading of a work is finding the uncanny in it, that we are estranged and to which we may become reconciled. The shock of recognition is not the facile confirmation of what is already present to our consciousness, but the more difficult realization of what we have ignored or repressed in our lives. One can see why Goodhart's Freudian approach would not quite fit the bill on the morning talk shows in which conservative critics lambast tenure radicals for refusing to teach value-oriented literature as a way to inculcate conformity to tradition. At the same time, Goodhart's assessment of the personal significance of reading a classic, it teaches us about our own otherness, is not precisely what ideological critics are interested in noticing about texts that they wish to resist and demystify uh, as concealing political, gendered, and imperial interests. Quote, the life of the mind does not subsist in either or, he writes in the introduction to culture and the radical conscience. I'll just add a couple more pages here and then I'll stop. In spite of thematic similarities, as well as the deep and wide learning he shares with Gro Grossman, Goodhart's personality in print diverges from Grossman's, and so his writings in tone and temperament seem antithetical to Grossman's. I suppose one could say he is in the tradition of the Partisan Review New York intellectuals of the 1940s and 50s, and he was a student of Lionel Trillings, for example, at Columbia, in the sense that his writings have an engaged quality, as Goodhart's essays, reviews, and books are entrances into the fray, are interventions in current debates. Reading Goodhart, I appreciate the intelligent, nuanced, sanely analyzed time capsules that evoke specific debates and contra controversies in historical moments of intellectual and academic life. He writes, for example, on the culture wars of the 80s and 90s, puncturing holes in the positions of extremists on both sides, and even challenging the idea of thinking of literary and cultural debate in terms of war. Goodhart wrote on Wayne Booth's The Company We Keep for the London Review of Books in 1989. Is it surprising that Goodhart is reviewing Booth? The book under discussion is concerned with ethical and interpersonal matters, but what is most Goodhartian in the Booth book is the Arnoldian willingness to think against oneself. In Booth's case, according to Goodhart's review, by taking an imaginative leap, not in the traditional sense of suspending disbelief and entering the fictional world of Huck Finn's Missouri or Jane Austen's England, but rather to try to imagine how readers from other subject positions, blacks who find Twain racist, feminists who chafe against Austen's complicity with male authority and Emma, construct their reading of works that Booth clearly loves, but feels the need to understand as best he can from other points of view. In a piece written during President Obama's first term, Goodhart, himself a liberal and red diaper baby, defends Obama against dogmatic left-wingers who disagreed with Obama's willingness to compromise on policy initiatives with moderate Republicans. Here is part of Goodhart's critique of the left-wing critics, quote, anyone who has read the history of the Lincoln and Roosevelt administrations has to be struck with the unfairness of the contrast. Their presidencies proceeded through fits and starts, hesitations and uncertainties. Rarely did they avoid making compromises to achieve results, either unread in that history or willfully ignoring it. Obama's critics expressed dismay and disbelief at every failure, every inconsistency, apparent and real in his performance. Goodhart's reading of presidential history revises our view of legendary reformers such as FDR, who are, in retrospect, usually recalled as larger-than-life political giants who pushed through major legislation such as the New Deal with a supreme confidence in their righteousness. Goodhart connects FDR to Obama as flawed, as flawed insecure people who lacked a grand map to reach policy objectives that sometimes succeeded, sometimes failed, and almost always were the product of compromise with opponents who held different views about how to get the country to a better place. Quote, their presidencies proceeded through fits and starts, hesitations and uncertainties. Rarely did they avoid making compromises to achieve results. I just can't imagine Grossman writing about who even the greatest of our leaders were flying blind, patching their programs together as best they could into a coherent perspective. I suspect Grossman would have a much harder time than Goodhart in acknowledging that even great men like FDR lack the ultimate vision to avoid mistakes and compromises to achieve a reasonably good outcome to their planning. Uh, just to finish up here. In summa, Grossman declared his understanding of the truth of poetry from the steep and icy peak. Goodhart's tone is oddly authoritative, but is far less convinced that his perspective is beyond challenge or refinement. In fact, one of Goodhart's complaints about much recent criticism is that the author refuses, in Goodhart's terms, to think against himself, and so challenge approaches driven by groupthink and ideology. Occupying a centrist position because unwilling to deny valid positions held by opposing participants in a debate, the goal is to resist dogmatic perspectives and to honor the fact that all points of view are inherently limited and therefore flawed and subject to revision and change. 
There is a, this is true, isn't it, quality to his style that, as I've grown older, have come to realize is, ironically, a sign of the author's confidence because an indication that he is open to revealing his vulnerabilities. Perhaps Grossman's commanding bardic style reveals his insecurity, his need to assume an aggressive posture to deflect criticism. I think of the scene from, this is the last little thing I'll say, I think of the, the scene from The Wizard of Oz in which the fire and brimstone display of the great Oz is revealed to stem from a lost man who has no real power to make magical things happen. It is only after the little dog, Toto, reveals from behind a curtain that the sweating, frightened man who is frantically manipulating levers to manufacture the spectacle is in fact the great Oz, that the Kansas-born human-scale Oz can actually help Dorothy and her companions by bestowing upon them qualities they already possess but hadn't realized. It's interesting to me that as I recall Monsieur's good heart engrossment and reflect on my post-PhD struggle to make my way in, a world, in the world, a tale from my childhood has come to mind. What this tells me is that my memories of that time, when I was already in my late 20s, later 20s, are indelibly bound up with images I saw as a young child. And what this tells me is that I was looking for love and support from men like Grossman and Goodhart, both born within a year or two of my own late father, on the deep level of a child who needed a father's protection. Okay. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Uh, very well done. I think we will take a small break, maybe five minutes, help yourself to refreshments, move around a bit, and then we'll do Q&A for the last half hour or so. Elaborate on that notion that the classics isn't what we really think they are, but they, they draw on the stranger in ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think I'm kind of following it. Yeah. It's not this clear uh, presentation of the human condition. Right. But I, could you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think as I was reading that, I, I was—I just want to say—it was an interesting experience to read that piece out loud. I hadn't, you know, hadn't read it out loud. I can feel the. There's a little bit of an aside that I'll come back to. That I had such a strong—I just want to say—libidinal investment in the Grossman band. I mean, it was just so strong. I could just feel the emotions when I was reading it, and my mixed feelings, you know, and the love-hate, and really like. Father, you know. <laughs> and the good part thing, I think, was more. I don't know. It had a different feeling to me when I read it, and it was more. I was writing about more of a moderate figure, you might say, more of a kind of balanced. And uh, I never studied with Goodhart actually, which is interesting. I never took a class with him. Um, and uh, and I, because I looked down on him. You know, I did. I, I looked down on Goodhart, and I, I thought of him as a wimp, you know, as, as a wishy-washy, and just not as a power, not as a powerful figure. You know, he wasn't, he, he wasn't charismatic, you know. Um, balance, you know, and uh, the center, and kind of that liberal thing of respecting everyone's all sides, you know. And even as I was reading it, it sounded a little, it didn't sound as good as I wanted it to sound, to be honest with you, you know. Um, you know, there's something sensible about his positions, and liberal, I guess, you know. And uh, I guess sort of that's the person that I sort of feel like I am at some times, and then realize that it doesn't, still doesn't quite feel like it's right for me, you know what I mean? I guess I'm still searching, you know. I, I can tell the Grossman thing doesn't feel quite like my model or my image of how I'd like to go about things. Uh, and the good heart thing didn't <laughs> quite see that either. You know? But I, I guess I'm just reflecting on the modest quality of, of maybe good heart's claims and my own kind of modest enthusiasm for it, I guess. But it just comes back to Jimmy's thing, you know, which is um, I do respect his point, which is that it is when people. I think his point is that people tend to lump rather than split, sort of. You know, by that I mean to say that it, they take something like the canon, and that he had a whole essay on that, and that was the one that I was talking about, and um, kind of allow it to accrue certain values or meanings that it doesn't have, because there is no it there, you know what I mean? And that he's well read enough and intelligent enough and nuanced enough to realize the ridiculousness uh, and, and the contradictory nature of, you know, again, Adam Smith and Marx in the same, or in the canon together, you know, and how do you 
that doesn't stand for any particular value system or project. Uh, you know, at the same time, and I kind of felt uneasy as I was reading this part, he does fall a little bit into that argument about the kind of elitism, elitism of the left, that why don't those critics write in a way that uh, the average Joe can understand, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know how sensible that argument is because they're not writing for them, you know what I mean? That's not your audience for that kind of work. And some of the work is, I guess, I mean, as I'm saying that, I think a lot of what I was, what I'm struggling with, I guess, in the piece and in my own sense of self as a writer and a teacher and an intellectual person, does have to do with issues about style and tone and, and sort of level of discourse, kind of. And I, at times I felt, rereading Grossman, that it was, that I was drawn more to the aura of the language than, than the sense of that I really did understand it in a way that ma meant something. It was more that the, it was the, the affect of it, you know, that mattered to me. Not, did I get it? Or did it really mean something? You know? At the same time, Good Hearts almost has a quality of, it's, it, it lacks that kind of um, uh, sense of, of the significance, really. I, I, it's hard to, I mean, I think he gets it a little more with the, the Matthew Arnold segment that I was reading, and, I, and, and the, the, the way of reading St. Paul, you know, is more of a kind of a symbolic way of talking about the inner life or spirituality. I, I kind of, I liked that quality. But, um, but the way he was trying to kind of moderate debates about the canon, um, I'm not sure that, I, that that fed me, you know, the way that, that no, it, it's. It, I think the end of my piece was important because I tried to. I tried to kind of say that this was coming from a, a, a deep, and I don't get into this in this piece at all. I, I, but deep needs, you know. I guess that's kind of what the piece was, was trying to get at a little bit, or that I was actually enacting or acting out or whatever you want to say. That I was ex expressing the way that, as a young person, you know, or, and then even today, you know without a father, I was clearly looking to these guys for something that maybe that's part of the, I don't know, I don't know, that that's part of the process of having a, a dissertation advisor, you know, and going through the process, you know what I mean? And probably everyone has their own story about that and the transferences and the, it's a very psychological, you know, it's almost like the analyst and the, and the, the patient or something, you know, and it, it's a very complex, it's, it's got a lot of, um, probably transference and projection and you know what I'm saying? And I and I think I and these guys and that was, you know, Grossman, he even his name had that kind of, you know, in good heart. He was always a, a kindly good heart, you know. And, and he really was, you know, he really was, even though he never I never worked for uh, I never studied with him. I have to say, um, I'm sorry I'm showing on here, but uh, Goodhart here's something and it's like a personal story. You know, as I was really struggling in the job market, and, and, and believe me, I struggled. I, you know, I don't think anybody struggled, struggled, I really struggled with it, you know. And faced it, Mary knows, because she was there. She was, I mean, unbelievable amounts of rejection. <laughs> Mary and I went to Brandeis together, so she knows these people and everything. And uh, she knows how I, how I struggled with that. And, um, you know, it was hard for me because Grossman, was his, his star was ascending when I was there. I mean, I, I was basically there the late 80s into the early 90s, you know. And that's when he got that MacArthur grant in 89, and then he went to Johns Hopkins, and there was a very famous modernist named Hugh Kenner, who was like the Brooke Pound era, I think. Uh, and, and, and he had had this chair, this Mellon professor. And so there Grossman got that chair, and that was like, whoa, he's really moving up, you know. And, and uh, he just a lot of positive things were happening professionally for him. And, you know, and then he moved away, you know, from, from little Brandeis, you know. And so I, I had that feeling of being an intellectual orphan, you know, just as I was entering the job market. And um, I think there really is something I'm right about that little story at the end about the Wizard of Oz, because I do think Grossman, he was like, he had this weird sense of being like an egomaniac with an inferiority complex, if you would. You know what I mean? With the, he had that quality of tremendous self-doubt and, and awkwardness and, and uh, inferiority and self-esteem issues. I really, I'm kind of like, at the same time, he had a very grandiose view of himself, you know? And I think what ended up happening 
for myself as somebody who has major problems with self-esteem issues and, and self-worth issues and so forth, that I allowed myself, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, to become a projection of his own fears about his cultural standing. And so I was, when he left Brandeis for Hopkins, I was still at Brandeis, you know, and I was kind of, it was a feeling that, I have to say this, that like, you were one of those second rate people, you know, that I worked with then. Now I'm working with, I'm, I'm up here, you know. And he kind of abandoned, he really did, he abandoned me, you know, I have to say it. And I asked for help on the job market and he, 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 didn't, he, he didn't help me. And I'd call him up and say, you know, you know somebody at this school, can you, can you, you know, the old boy network or whatever, I could go for anything I had there, you know, I wasn't much of an old boy or whatever, but whatever, and he happened to know someone, I don't know anybody there. Goodhart, who I never worked with, the only thing I did, and I mentioned on the list, I always did all these dirty jobs, I worked as a janitor all through and, uh, uh, grad school, and I catered, literally, this um, humanities seminar that Goodhart had. He got a grant to run this. And I was the guy who brought the hummus and the pita chips and the brownies and stuff. You know? So that's how I knew him. And uh, he let me sit in on some of these seminars. You know? I used to go there to bring home to the hovel and, uh, you know, all the extra hummus and everything. That's what I really read. I'd bring a big tray, the big you know, aluminum tray of hummus. You know? And we'd all eat, the 12 of us who lived in the thing. And, uh, but he said, you can sit in on the seminars. You know? And occasionally, and I actually took advantage of it. I read, you know, it was, uh, Rousseau and all the very, very heavy stuff, you know, good stuff. And uh, Hannah Rent. I mean, I remember they read this other faculty and I would sit there. And occasionally I would make a comment, you know, and once in a while he'd say, oh, that's a good point or something. So he kind of, you know, knew me through that. So I remember calling him up. And, and, I, and I'm like, you know, I was already, I think, a couple of years out of my dissertation. And I was, you know, they talked about damaged goods if you didn't get a job. It was really rough. And, uh, I said, you know, I have this chance to get a postdoc somewhere. And he's like, well, ask, shouldn't you be asking Mr. Grossman for this help? You know, almost like, where's your father? You know, it's like death of a salesman, you know. When, 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 when Willie Bowman goes to, you know, goes to Howard Wagner, and he's like, go to your kids, you know, they'll help you. It's like, well, I remember that feeling of like, where's your father? You know, you will not help me, Mr. Grossman. Good so Goodhart, he actually wrote a note to the, and I got the, you know, the temporary position, and it, so I, I think that, that it was almost like a way of wanting to say thank you, because he was a mensch, you know what I mean? Maybe he was, I guess that's part of what I'm coming, trying to get at here, and, it, and I know Mary and I have talked about this. I mean, the reality is, I know that word genius does get thrown around. It, I do think this guy Grossman was kind of a genius. I mean, and he, he's still alive, although he, he's getting much older, and he, he's, you know, like has Alzheimer's and stuff, but, but he was, yeah, he, he was just, if you were around him, you knew. Um, there was just something about him that was on a different level, you know, certainly than someone like me, you know, reasonably intelligent, reasonably well-read, you know, decent student or whatever. I mean, this guy was a major international thinker, you know, I mean, he really was powerful. And, and in some way, oh, I guess I'm saying that, I, in a way I had no business working with him, you know, I mean, because I was not like that, you know, and, um, but I was drawn, drawn to the power, maybe, you know, the magnetism. Uh, if I could say what he said, if I could repeat that, if I could just be connected to him, maybe they'll, they won't notice, you know, that I'm missing some of that grandeur, you know. And uh, I guess the piece was my attempt to try to recover a good heart and say, well, if I could be a good heart, that's good, you know. But as I read the piece, I guess I'm just saying that I felt like it didn't quite don't quite feel, maybe that's the answer, you can't, it's not, you're not Grossman, you're not Grossman, you're Dan, you know what I mean, or you're Warren, or you're Mary, or you're Arcadia, or you're Mick, you know, Michael, or whatever it is, you know what I mean, you're Jimmy, and you try to find that, and this is still a middle-aged person searching for that model, you know, yes? Yeah, I, actually, several things, really, um, I have had lunch with him, and, <laughs> okay. uh, well, but, we <laughs> and, and oh, no, with Grossman, yeah, Grossman. Can I just, before but, you say that, yeah. I just need to say one thing, and I, Grossman could be very, very charming. Just to give you, I mean, and for people that he no, he was just like you said. Was he? He was very overbearing. Yeah, was yeah, he? Okay. Yeah. But because I mean, just I, my sister-in-law is a very intense person, and one time I'll let you say your thing just one time. But and one time we all went to the Baltimore at that time is at Hopkins, and we went to the Baltimore Museum of Art and had lunch at the cafeteria. 
and my uh, sister-in-law is a, a very intellectual person, and, uh, and her husband also, and I just sat there like a fly while they talked, and at the end we went back to the car. My sister-in-law said, what a career, you know, she was just like, what an amazing guy, you know, and I, you know what I mean, she just, it was like a meeting of minds, yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. so they connected, and so he could yeah. turn it on, but for others, it just wasn't there, what were you going to say, But it, no, it, it's, um, there's several things in a the way, there's a slightly autistic quality about it, isn't there? Totally. Yeah. I, I, mean, yeah. I mean, I had a long footnote about, I know yeah. a guy who has Augsburgers, mm -hmm. and um, when I was writing this last spring, and we were, I was talking about this, and he, the guy has Augsburgers, and he said, and I was telling him, do you know what? This sounds like somebody who has Augsburgers. And I wrote this long, long, I have like a page, but I didn't yeah. bring that up, but that's so interesting. Yeah, but and, and another thing, just like, I'm sorry to be holding forth here, no, but that, so then I, think it's, I think it's sort of important in a way that you, yeah. about your father, you said, I was oh. raised by a single, no, wait a minute, yeah. wait. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, you said I was raised by a single mother, right. and then you said my late father. I think it's important for people to know that your father died young. Yeah, she was when I was like 10 years old. She, right. she was a widow, right? right. She yeah. was a widow, and right. so I mean, that really she, is very totally. important. Totally, yeah. And he was literally but, the same age, I mean, my father was born in 1929, sure. Rose was born in 32, sure. Goodhart was born in 31. Right. Yeah. But, but then my other question, and, and this, this is pretty extreme, I think, and yeah. I, so I'm interested to see what you think about yeah. that. Um, you, well, just to sort of like a, to lead up to it, you, you said about maybe his insecurity. I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm only going to talk about no, it. No, it's really right. Anyway. Yeah. Um, it is more a temperamental thing than an insecurity thing, if you can make that decision, dis distinction, I think. Almost as though, you know, an it's almost as though. For it to be insecurity, he would have had to have been more in control. You know what I mean? But but the point I want to yeah. ask you about actually, yeah, please. which which dawned on me here, yeah. and that is, um, you know, as as you were talking, there's also that question of what explains yeah. his focus on what I think of these related things. Yes. The you said post catastrophic. Right. Sacrificial, commemorative. Yes. This is somebody writing after the Holocaust, totally. before totally. you know, before the Holocaust was really very widely uh -huh. discussed. And he's yeah. I was rereading from the yeah. Sighted Singer, and he goes on. And I mean, again, somebody born in 1932, you know, yeah. and going to like college in the 50s, and he he says that was so vivid to him, and like such a tr an un. I mean, that concept that we have, I think, of the Holocaust as a framed event, and someone like Warren would know much more about that. You know, like, I mean, even the, the term, I think, was like Elie Wiesel's term, I believe, that came only around, let's say, 1960 or something, and this idea of us understanding this event, it was like this open wound, I mean, this unmanageable... Unaddressed. Unaddressed. Yeah, yeah. And so, but he, he writes directly about that in, in The Sighted Singer, yeah. that that is a... And then the other thing, and I don't get into this uh, here, um, um, he has a fan, one of I think his better poems in the book. It's called "The Woman on the Bridge Over the Chicago River." I think it was one of the first books he did with New Directions Press. I think mm -hmm. in '79. It's a very moving poem, and he's he's sort of wandering. I, I wrote a piece about this that I didn't include here. On the, along with the Wrigley Building, and the snow is falling, and he sees this woman, like a, almost his mother, really, uh, uh, on the on the bridge, and and the world is crying and so forth. It's this very kind of moving, surreal, kind of highly psychological, resonant thing. And my understanding was that something happened to Grossman and again, Mary, when he was like at, at Harvard where he, he apparently lost the ability to speak. And then he went to Chicago to see, I believe it was like a, a psychoanalyst that he would see like once a week or every day, I don't know, whatever. But he was almost, I wouldn't say homeless, but he would basically like wander the city of Chicago, mute apparently, um, and till he recovered this voice, but it's this personhood voice. It's yeah. this cons reconstructed sense of self, you know, that's not... Sort of oracular. Yeah, right? that isn't yeah. a human-to-human -human kind of human-scale interactive social thing. It's a made thing, you know. And I don't know how he recovered in that whole process. I don't know enough about that story, but I feel like there was something that happened, and it, it could be related to the, the world catastrophe of the Holocaust as well as you know, kind of some, some personal or psychological or neurological, I don't know, uh, uh, terror that he went through. But that then to turn to poetry as somehow this potential 
salvation, you know, again, that Emily Dickens, because I could not say it, I wrote it out in verse. There was, he always would talk about how people were this blockage between the I and the you and the desire to get to the we. You know, that was what he was always talking about. There, there was some blockage, you know. And again, I mean, I, I was so drawn to that, you know. Yes, Warren. No, no, you went. So two, two quick things. One, one, I haven't heard this tape thing, but the little bit that you should yeah. play, and you said this was for general audiences. Yeah, this is from that superstar teaching series. Right, poetry exactly. based. I mean, even what you played. Well, that's it. In oh. Unreachable. It's unbelievable. As I'm singing London Bridge. Oh, well, that's, that's great. Really basic. It's a great reading. Uh, uh, really basic, but really crucial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but, right, and what but happened, I mean, the level of discourse seemed rather. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's unbelievable, and that's toward the end of the, I was just listening in the car today. It's almost like he, he starts off trying to be accessible. Mm -hmm. About 10 minutes into yeah. the talk, you can just feel he is now in his own <laughs> zone. Zone! <laughs> you know, he's the Michael Jordan, and he is you got to wonder about the editors of this when they got this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to go for this. Yeah. He probably turned off generations of I don't know. <laughs> it's probably, it's probably, it's probably had the opposite effect. Not no, either, not he sings. He sings. Yeah. Yeah. My fair lady. Yeah. Yeah. Sticks and stones. Yeah. Fair away. Yeah. And he considers that the essence of poetry. He considers the game, the essence of poetry, yes. is to heal the breach. Yes, exactly. To heal the breach. The breach. Yeah, my, yeah. Other, my other quick yeah. point was so, yeah. so what drew me up from Crawfordsville. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I'm 10 years earlier, and so my teachers in graduate school were Alfred Kazin, um, Irving Howe, no. Irving Howe wow. and John Hollander. Wow. So now, Hollander was an exact contemporary of Grossman's at Harvard. They, well, they, were... they, they share certain personality mm -hmm. traits. I, mean, I don't want to say anything about the dead since he died about three weeks ago or a month ago. John Hollander? John Hollander. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Oh. Yeah, he, he did die, and, and oh. it was in the Times. I'm sorry. But he, he, in my PhD orals, <laughs> On po modern poetry, he destroyed me. Wow. I mean, and, and I had always avoided classes with him. Yeah. But I, there's a kind of mm -hmm. hostility amongst mm -hmm. these these Jewish yeah. intellectuals, yeah. Um, which was, and Kazan was my advisor. And so it's that same thing that you were talking about, this yeah. kind of religion, looking for a father figure. Yeah. My father was uh, dropped out of high school, right. you know, first generation. Right. And yeah. then I'm connecting to this guy, this Alfred Kazan, who also didn't get a PhD, right. but is a, is a university level. Oh, you know, giant for him. Yeah. So this this kind of yeah. personal things made me remember yeah. how I was trying to you know get his approval. I mean, his the letter he wrote for my job stuff, which I got to look at eventually, was like five lines tight yeah. with mistakes. Wow! And it was like, these people did not know how no, to support the right. graduate students. Yeah. It was it was absolutely amazing. So and and how I had with Irving how, and these were guys writing at the time major works on Jewish totally. stuff. Yeah. But yet they were also critics of American literature and. And so Irving Howe I had for, for a course in Henry James. Okay. So there, you know, full yeah. course. And, right. and I, said, I was talking at, a, at the end of the year, oh, giving a presentation, and he reached out and said, who are you? Yeah. And I said, who am I? I've been in the class for 14 wow. weeks. <laughs> you don't know who I am. So it's this kind of, you know, these, these men were, were abs you know, absolutely amazing and really difficult to deal with. So when I hear you talk about trying to kind of reach out to them for a fathering, ooh, it's, it's a rough, rough deal. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I couldn't have, and I, I kind of, again, in the longer version where I talk about this segment of it, the, the, you know, this really damaged person, you know, the, 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 the time when he was in Chicago. I mean, I was just picking the worst choice. I mean, it, it, it's, it's but staggering to me. he was inspiring, me. though, wasn't he? I mean, <laughs> for someone like Mary, who I do think is like more of a yeah. genius, he like Mary Leader. Uh, he, he, he doesn't have this dynamic. No, it's not he's about. I think it's not gender. I, I think don't it's intelligence. Some kind of a sleazy, pervy way. Yeah. He's uh, he would like Arcadi. He would like Larry. Like, like, <laughs> like Jimmy. <laughs> he's not like me. But he's, he's, so, so, he's so married sure. to this. No, he's so yeah, but he doesn't. Yeah. Okay, I have an anecdote. He is. He is. He is so courtly. And when I went to hear him read over in Harvard, I met him at Warren Wilson. Here he came where it's the right. program, and he came and only gave you know he came for two or three days, and with this. Rusty black suit, and this, and right. this is in the mouth of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. right. So anyway, he wanders around all, you know, it's in July, and he has on his tie and all of this. And uh, he, it was like being in a room with a generator. He was talking about mm -hmm. it was when he was doing that work on Orpheus and, and right the, Philomel, the Philomel yeah, story, great stuff. which were the, the the founding the founding history, the founding stories of yeah. poetry. Mm -hmm. How you, I mean, it was the it was like the 
on the most poss basic possible level how to be, it was a how to. Yes. How to be a poet. You must be like Orpheus, which means completely cut off right. from human right. intercourse. Philomela, you must have your tongue cut out. Right. Uh, he considered it, you know, after an extremist, then comes poetry. Right. You must reach what I think of as the, you know, as, as the ditch of the ineffable, where language must be born, and then it will. He always told us, listen to the silence before the poem. Mm -hmm. And but and just in terms of his mannerisms, though, and his way towards people, then I then he uh, he gave a reading uh, at Brandeis one time. Do you remember Arlene? Oh, of course, Arlene. Uh, wonderful was. old, you yeah. know, sort of yenta, yet secretary of the English department who had been there, you know, forever and ever. Very, you know, nice person. Yeah. Very kind of you know uh, self possessed. Yeah, and, and but but helpful, you know. And, he, Very much and, so. and so after he gave the reading here, we were all plus all his people had adored him, and you know, and people had brought relationships with him, and all his colleagues and other poets, Frank and Dark, and other people were around. He walked up to Arlene and said, "Did you like it?" Wow. Yeah. And she said, "Yes, Alan, I did." <laughs> and so that's, I mean, he's. Uh, I, yeah. He never. He didn't get into a father daughter thing. It was a father son well, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, forgive me for taking it out of this no. personal. No, no, no. I mean, if this is a possible question. But, you, know, <laughs> you mentioned at some point, and I wonder when that was, that discussion of St. Paul. Yeah. When was that? What time? Um, that was the good heart piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. When was I that? think I was in the skeptic disposition. Oh, uh, not yeah. sure. I have to say, good heart has written a ton. I mean, I've gone back and, I mean, he's probably written like 20 books, I mean, from like the 60s. He, just, he has a new book out now in 2000, uh, you know, it's like on Amazon. It's still unbelievably productive. Um, again, the work not necessarily shattering, but I'm only saying that because I, I'd have to go back and look at which one of his books, but it could have been in the skeptic disposition, which was around 89, somewhere in there. Yeah, because around that time, actually, okay. St. Paul became a part of discussion. Leotard wrote a book on St. Paul. Isn't that interesting? So did by you. Okay, so, so that, that would make total sense to me. It's interesting that St. Paul became a figure mm -hmm. around that time, and that's yeah. really it of some interest. Yeah, it could have also been, he had another book called, um, well, so much of what Goodhart did was he was kind of reactive in a certain way. By that, to, I mean to say he he wasn't a person of original ideas in the way that Grossman was. He was somebody who was would react to the current climate. And so I would not be surprised. He was reading French theory, you know, and he was re he, but he was always trying to react to these people from a from the sense of a he had a sense that. And he understood what the center was, you know? Yeah, and of course, and, and, also, yes, St. Paul is a crucial figure for, in the context of Nietzsche. Okay. That's he, great, Arkady. Nietzsche is a, mm -hmm. is a really was a critic of Pauline Christianity, not so much of Christ. Okay. And Nietzsche so is a kind of Buddhist, you know, the uh, right. kind of. So I think that that is really, there is, there is a big his, history of St. Paul uh, as a part of that intellectual discussion on, a discussion on people were generally not mm -hmm. religious mm -hmm. or theists, and I think that uh, his Leotard, Leotard's book rather used the. I would personally love to study and, that. You know, and, and the kind of interest yeah. it was an unexpected. Yeah. I love that, and I, I it now it kind of that talk about inspiring. That's inspiring to me because I would want to go back and look at Goodhart and Matthew Arnold and Leotard and Berdo and see how that played itself out and what. What was that about? And Nietzsche as well, because that, that, that's a great thing. So I appreciate that. That's a very, yeah, I would not be surprised. I mean, again, he had a sense, of, I, I think I said he was like a, almost like reading him, it was like a time capsule. You know, you, he was engaged in, and that's why I also say he tended to, he was almost like a journalist. You know, he'd, he'd publish in, in the, the London Review of Books or in the, in the New York Review of Books, you know, or in um, Partisan Review, these kinds of places. You know, he was an engaged intellectual kind of battling often in a, a kind of resistant kind of word. That was a very important word to him. Pieces of Resistance is the name of one of his books, which is a series of these essays. Uh, often against what he saw as, you know, like the, again, sometimes caricature, you know, let's say the deconstructive project or something like that. But uh, that would make total sense to me. Uh, 
And Grossman wasn't like that. I mean, Grossman was, one time Grossman said to me, I remember we were walking toward the library, he just said, I have a plan. You know, and what he meant by that was from the age when he was probably in his 20s till, you know, when he stopped, when his brain gave out, it was all part of a project that he had. Un the early Grossman and the late Grossman, in some way, there's, there's not the distinction. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't this metamorphic kind of processual uh, uh, figure, you know, who was, who was sort of developing. He, he, it took time to, to, to write out the project. He has that beautiful book, Poems of a Young Man. Yes, Sweet Youth, I think it's called, mm -hmm. yeah. The other yes, thing about Grossman, and this is inspiring to some, I mean, uh, um, he, he didn't write that much. I mean, his ten, he wrote a tenure book, which was the Yeats, uh, uh, Poetic Knowledge in the Early Yeats, 1970. That's his, like, tenure. And that's his only real scholarly book. And then he did this thing called The Sighted Singer with his, one of his famous students, Mark Halliday, you probably know from Penn. I don't know, were you there? I, 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 I you know, both, yeah. but I mean, yeah, so Halliday, he did that kind of conversations. And then he did the Summa, you know, which is this kind of uh, Wittgensteinian, I guess, you know, uh, numbered pieces and so forth. And then sort of late in his career, there were some essays put together. He did a famous essay on Lincoln, often in these binaries, like he'd have Lincoln and Whitman, or Dickinson and Whitman, Yates and Stevens. Philomel and uh, and um, Orpheus, you know, and he would he worked in those kind of binaries, and then he would sometimes play with those, and then he collected those individual pieces, you know. He did one on Milton, but uh, was not a prolific, and he's a poet also. But uh, there, there, there's something really interesting about yeah. that. I, I'm trying to think when I met him. It must have been it was in the late '80s, I guess. But. He didn't have it easy, you know. I mean, it's very, it's very interesting uh -huh. that he, you know, you said that he said he had a plan. Now yes. that would be a very autistic type of thing. You create I structure. Yes. You, know, you, you, you work within that that totally. gives you safety. When I met him, he was totally. known primarily as a teacher, and right. it bothered him. If I think really? it bothered him. And shortly after that, he got all this recognition, exactly right. as right. you, mm -hmm. you know, because people say, well, right. he doesn't publish very much, right. but he's a brilliant teacher. Yeah. And I think it was Elaine Scarry. I don't know if she mm -hmm. worked with him at all, yeah. but she was, um, and then there, finally the recognition came, yeah. you know. In he had a way. handful of very influential, I mean, I think Barbara Excuse Smith, who yeah. was, I think, Arcadi's dissertation advisor, is that correct? I mean, I think that was Grossman's student, student well, or was no, that not I correct? No, 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 they no, weren't? It wasn't Grossman. She, okay. uh, she Cunningham, J.B. Cunningham. Okay, but um, another one, Sharon Cameron, who's at, at Hopkins, oh, so yes. a very she influential figure. Students. She was his yeah, student. Barbara. Yeah, and she was his student, and I think, and 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 I mean, and there, he just had a few people pulling from Susan Stewart, who's not wasn't really a student, but was always, I think, felt very strongly about him, and and and. and um, some of these people gained influence, and I think that's when he started. Yeah. Some good things happened that's him right. professionally, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, he, he uh, it was an obscure. And you know, it, the other thing that's amazing, in a way inspiring, I mean, so many of his books were really privately published, his poetry, or even Against Our Vanishing, which was the first version of these interviews he did with, uh, with Halliday, with Rowan Tree Press of Lexington, Mass., which is where he was from mm -hmm. in 1981. It was then recast with a later conversation in a Johns Hopkins book called The Sighted Singer that became kind of a, you know, a more famous book. Yeah. But um, it, it, you know, it wasn't until 1979, he was born in 1932, that he got his first connection with New Directions. And even New Directions had a kind of quirky situation in, in, in literary publishing associated more with like modernist poetry than with contemporary poetry. But he's, he's since published with New Directions. But it was with very small presses and self-published for most of his career. Yeah, now, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, this is a little off yeah. subject, yeah. but um, this, uh, this deep vein of productivity, but also a, a, a rigid limitation, if you could consider it the whole of poetry, of the commemorative act, mm -hmm. that poetry exists to preserve persons right. and names. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I'm thinking about his own poetry. Mm -hmm. He has written somewhat about, you know, but he, he is not someone who writes about social relationships <laughs> at all. It doesn't, you know, and, and, but, and, I, and what I want you to yeah. know, know what you think is, yeah. um, if there's, how he sees the mythological, because that's, a lot of his energy has gone mm -hmm. into thinking in mm -hmm. mythological terms, in archetypes, and mm -hmm. then in, in totally. the Greek, Greek yeah, mythology, and those whole, seem to be 
persons mm -hmm. to him more than the yeah. people that are around him. Sometimes. Yeah, that's his whole thing, and his whole reading of, and I, I can see but why I, he but was that, but just, how does that relate to the yeah. idea of commemorating yeah, 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 yeah. real people? No, no. I think one of the things that I was drawn to Grossman was that as opaque as he is and esoteric and high style, that he has a kind of radical simplicity you know, to him, which Mary's bringing up. And I even can tell some of my students, intro to poetry type students, I still remember some of his chestnuts, you know, um, and I could go into some of them. But what reminded me of saying that was his story about 20th century poetry uh, is the modernists, the high modernists, the people like Yeats and Eliot, were all about archetype, myth, sy systemic kind of thinking, the like cosmos. a vision, the cosmos, the per, you know, trying to develop personhood or the, uh, it could be, a, it could be a, a political structure, it could be a uh, ideological structure, it could be an economic structure for someone like Pound, it could be a religious structure for Eliot, uh, in which somehow, persons could get could could know each other but that they were unable to also imagine somehow the ephemeral quotidian uh, uh, flesh and blood uh, person uh, self in some kind of a uh, how would he put it in a, in a credible way they couldn't find that voice he would say like a Yeats poem is not spoken in even a human voice there's no human voice that can speak uh, among school children you know uh, or something like that. And then he would talk about people like Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop and the, and the kind of postmodern confessional writers. And Frank O'Hara would be an example, or this guy Mark Halliday would be a later example. And what he would sort of argue is, like in, uh, he talked there really in, in the Sighted Singer, a book like Day by Day, a late book by Lowell, that he was trying this kind of radical project of immediacy, you know what I mean, to, to kind of not dislodge lived being and representation. You know, try to get that, that end point of like, happening and, and, the, and the articulation of it. Or somebody like Frank O'Hara and the lunch poems would be associated with that as well. And he would talk about that as like a failed catastrophic project. So then he would say, the task is to find a way, can, is it possible to bring the two together you know, without it being you know, a terrible beauty like what you have in it. And I feel like at times he has attempted that in, like, in the rare places where he is able to, like he has one called Pat's poem which is about his, his nurse, Pat, you know, or he has one called The Department, where he talks about um, Boyne, this eccentric po uh, poet who, who didn't, never got his book done. He's got a handful of poems. Again, the moments in like the Chicago River where we latch onto a sense of place, a sense of weather, environment, an individual, an emotion that can somehow mediate or negotiate with, with that huge speculative cosmic project. And I think those are the moments I treasure when I, when I read his poetry, but they're few and far between, and I think he has really struggled. His later writings, I think he's tried to add a greater sense of humor. Uh -huh. I, I know we have to go, humor and a kind of almost bizarre quality, like he has a poem called Shazam, for example, or he just, he, even the typography in some of his later books are very playful. Um, even this thing, you know, using ideas like how to do things with tears, you know, there's a sort of self-conscious playfulness in his later work that speaks to a more human touch that I think, but it, it still has a very artificial quality. So he just, I think it's, it's a, great, a great struggle that he doesn't necessarily feel has been accomplished, but it's the one that he sees as the fundamental struggle. And sorry if I yeah. cut you off there, um, but if you'll Thank join you. me in. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, the next talk is October 17th, three weeks from today, for Dr. Lance Warburton. <laughs>